You did an experiment, didn't you? Quite a famous experiment now, where you put yourself on an ultra processed food diet. Can you tell me about that experiment and the symptoms that you saw when you did lived off ultra processed food pretty much exclusively? Uh, so I, I ate a diet that's very normal for a British teenager. I ate 80% of my calories from ultra processed food. So for a, for a teenager in, in you know, the, the, my kid's school, for example, it would, this would be a completely normal thing to do. One in five people in this country get 80% of their calories from EPA. So I wasn't really putting my body on the line. Um, I was switching from 20% to 80%. Um, kind of two really big things happened. There was some health effects. So um, in terms of the physical effects on my body, I gained so much weight. And I was not it wasn't supersized me. I wasn't forcing it in. This was done as part of a... Um, a scientific experiment for a big study that I'm now running at, at University College London, where I where I work as an academic. I gained so much weight that in, if I'd continued for a year, I would have doubled my body weight. We scanned my brain before and after. I worked with colleagues at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neuroscience, so neurology and neurosurgery. So this, these were scans done very expertly. And while I'm only one patient, you can you can subtract the noise. You can be very sure that what you see is real. We saw enormous. In increases in connectivity be, be, between the the automatic behavior habit bits at the back of the brain and those reward addiction bits right in the middle of the brain. So we can't exactly say what's happening, but certainly behaviors and rewards are getting much, much more connected. Most significantly, I think we saw a change in my hormonal response to a meal. So when you eat real food, Whilst you're eating, you're chewing, all kinds of hormonal and neurological changes happen in your body that will come to a point they'll say, look, you've had enough, Stephen, you're, you're fine, you can stop eating now. And that's called satiety. And we've evolved this mechanism since living things first started eating food hundreds of millions of years ago. And uh, all animals have it and humans have it too. What we saw is that the, at the end of a standard meal, at the end of this month, my hunger hormones remain sky high. So this is food that is interfering with our body's evolved mechanisms to say, I am done, it's time to stop eating. But there was, there was this other thing that happened, kind of the most important thing, and it's at the core of the book, is that midway through this diet, which I was quite enjoying, you know, if you're, if you're a sort of middle-aged man trying to, you know, the, the quest is always to lose, lose weight, and I could go back to eating the foods of my childhood, and I was eating hot wings and all this stuff that I hadn't eaten for years. I was really enjoying it, but I was also doing all this research, partly for the book, and I'm you know, as a scientist, I study nutrition. And uh, I was talking to a colleague in Brazil called Fernanda Rauber, and she just kept saying, this isn't food, Chris. It's an industrially produced edible substance. And I sat down that evening to meet, eat a, a meal of, of takeaway fried chicken, and I, I could hardly finish it. And she had flicked this switch in my brain where all of this ultra-processed food had become disgusting. But I then had to keep eating it for another fortnight. And so it was a bit like the very famous book, The Easy Way to Quit Smoking, where you smoke all the way through reading the book while you learn about smoking. And by the end of the diet, I, I, I mean, I now don't want to eat any ultra processed products. So the, the gift I'm trying to give the reader is if you're living with addiction, my invitation at the beginning is eat along, eat while you read. Don't forbid this stuff to yourself. Let yourself wallow in it, immerse it, taste it. And you'll start to re and read the ingredients lists while you eat. And you'll realize that all the food is, it has the same flavor profile. It's all equally salty and sugary and sweet. It's all acidic. Um, and you will gradually become disgusted. And I, that's not a promise. That seems to be what's happening to a lot of people. And that is a very well evidenced technique when it comes to living with addiction. So the World Health Organization, who I work with, recommends the easy way to quit smoking for quitting smoking. Uh, as as being as useful as patches or any other technique. So I'm for the individual treating it as an addictive substance may be really useful for some people. What was the impact on your sort of mental health and how you felt from a sort of psychology perspective? Because I, you know, we've seen the, this huge rise in sort of mental health diagnoses across the board, especially in younger younger people. But it seems to be pretty consistent throughout different ages and demographics. And I wondered if there's a link between ultra processed foods and mental health crises that we're living through. We've got really good epidemiological data. So we now have hundreds of prospective studies, which are the best, the kind of studies we use to link smoking to, to cancer. 
that it is not just associated with physical ill health, metabolic disease, inflammatory disease, cardiovascular disease, cancers, early death. It's also associated with anxiety, depression, and also dementia. And um, my experience of being on the diet was that um, it, there was a, there was a there was a thing that I think the research doesn't capture, which is because it's salty. I was getting up to pee more at night. And I was, I, I don't know if we can say this, I was getting really constipated and, and uncomfortable because it's quite low in fiber. And so I got in this vicious cycle of sleeplessness and I'd often find myself where at the fridge in the kind of small hours of the morning and the food felt like the solution to the problem. So I got in this spiral of sleeplessness, anxiety, overeating. And we, we know that stress and elevated cortisol also generally increases your desire for, for low quality food and makes people overeat. So in a way, that kind of middle-aged stress, anxiety, those sort of mild mental health symptoms that so many people live with, often it is just driven by by the food. I read this um, stat in your book that according to the World Obesity Federation, 51% of the world or more than 4 billion people will be obese or overweight within the next 12 years. So I like to say they will live with obesity um, rather than the, rather than use obese as an adjective because I think the biggest problem for people who live with obesity is stigma. It's that being obese is your identity. And what we actually know is the, the, the World Obesity Federation are doing some really good work identifying this as the major public health problem. The ticklishness talking about this is it's really hard to say that obesity is a problem without also saying that people who live with it are the problem. And if you're not careful, a war on obesity becomes a war on people who live with it. And I think the evidence is very clear. It's just about the food environment. So yes, you can make these very powerful economic arguments that we simply cannot afford to have a food system that's driving this rate of disease. Um, I think the moral arguments are much more powerful that this is stuff that causes human suffering. So I, I would not actually tax ultra processed food and I certainly wouldn't ban it. I think all my arguments are about increasing freedom, increasing choice, increasing opportunity. And that's quite conscious. So you, I mean, you you know this as a, as a skillful communicator. And you talk about kind of doing exactly this in your book, where I'm trying to make an argument that will appeal to the political right that are much more on the side of, of uh, you know, free market, low regulation. And in fact, we can have regulations completely compatible with huge economic growth. And what I'm asking for is a food system where people with low incomes have access to healthy, affordable food. Because a lot of people would say, and this is sort of part two of your book, that, okay, so the solution here is really just for people to make better choices when they're, I don't know, in their fridges or when they're walking through a supermarket. Why don't we just all make better choices? I mean, you you will, you may have a much more profound, I, I think you're asking this question in a provocative yeah, way. I, I think you will understand it much better than me. I've always had choice. And so when I choose to buy things that are unhealthy, it, it, it is with a degree of choice. I do, my, my patients, um, I run a clinic at the hospital for tropical disease where I work. And most of my patients have no addresses. They're very disadvantaged. They're migrants, asylum seekers. Um, they come from very low income families because those are the people who get infections. Now, when I say to them, go and eat some healthy food, they all know what healthy food is. They've often got very, they're very diverse communities. They've often got very rich traditions of healthy food from the, the communities or the cultures they've come from. They are completely unable to buy it. In the case of the asylum seekers, they're on eight pounds a day and they can't work. You can't, you can't say to someone, spend your eight pounds a day on apples and broccoli and meat. They haven't got knives to cut it with. Now we know a million households in this country don't have fridges, freezers, stovetop cookers. So there are a huge number of families that only have a microwave to cook. And fresh food, while there is always a politician willing to advance this argument, like, but you can buy a bag of lentils. If you go to the cash and carry, you can buy rice or lentils for, you know, a couple of quid for 10 kilos. It costs money to heat it. It costs time. Time is the most expensive thing for, for people with low incomes. They need pots, pans, cutting boards, knives, uh, Tupperware. If you're going to batch cook, which is the only way to make home cooking economical, you've got a deep freeze to store it in. So saying to people with low incomes, you know, make healthier choices, it is, it is nonsense. 
It's just, it's, it's, and so a bit, I feel very strongly, it, the world does not need another person like me saying that. And in fact, no one, I mean, we all, people hate being told what to do. There was a study done on toddlers in 1920 that you write about, which is quite illuminating, where they got to choose their own food from a selection of un, unprocessed foods. And the children instinctively chose their own diet, which met their nutritional needs and cal calorie intake. What was that experiment and what does that indicate to us about the nature of this argument what, as it relates to just being able to control what we eat and choose what we want? If we look at the animal kingdom, even if you look at something you might think has quite a simple diet, like a, like a big herbivore living in, you know, any of the big herbivores living on any of the big plains of the world, and you think, well, they just eat grass. They don't. We've done loads of experiments where you put, it sounds a bit unkind, but you put a hole in the neck of the animal and you put a bag on the hole and you collect the plants they're eating. And you can do this in a way that's relatively humane. And what we discover is if we study goats or cows, they're eating 50 or 60 different plants a day. Calories are abundant. And what those animals are doing is balancing all their nutritional needs from all those different plants and selecting them and learning them about the flavor profile and the mineral content. They're moving to avoid predators and the rains to different soils. So animals are incredibly sophisticated at, at perfectly balancing their nutritional needs from their environment. And obesity is uh, non-existent in the wild animal kingdom. In urban animals, actually, that start to scavenge from humans, there is some evidence of obesity. But in wild animals, there is, there is no obesity. Humans, it turns out, obviously have the same ability. And so a scientist called uh, Clara Davis, who's an amazing woman, she was, she was a, a gay woman, uh, one of the first medical graduates in, in North America. And she did this experiment where she was, a, she was taking abandoned kids in, essentially, it was, functioned almost like an orphanage. And each child got access to 34 different whole foods every single day. And it was things like there was raw bone marrow and cooked rice and yogurt and milk. And they had a little bowl of salt. They could have as much or as little salt as they wanted. And her question was, could the kids balance their nutritional needs? And the best example was a kid called Earl, who she uh, took in at a few months old. And he came in with rickets. So he had very bad vitamin D deficiency, he had bendy bones. And they did some x-rays and you could see the rickets on the x-rays. And every single day, he would glug an entire cup of cod liver oil, which at the time was one of the only, really the only source of vitamin D. And he'd drink this every single day, enthusiastically. He always wanted his cod liver oil. And on the day his rickets were healed and you couldn't see them anymore on the x-rays, he stopped drinking the cod liver oil, never asked for it again. And none of the kids without vitamin D deficiency would drink, would touch the cod liver oil. So something in Earl's body was saying, I will, when I need this stuff, I'll have it. And once I don't need it anymore, I won't have any more of it. And all the kids that she studied over many, many years with access to a full range of foods perfectly matched all their nutritional needs. They all grew really well. They were intellectually well-developed. They're extremely healthy. And they didn't have any of the sort of food refusal problems that, that parents have nowadays. So, and she knew very well that the point was the kids only had access to good food she wasn't giving them access to um, industrially processed junk foods which were still slightly available in in the 20s it was a really cool experiment for me i, I take away from that that our bodies can kind of self-regulate what we need if they're in an environment where the options are good so if i'm a parent and i'm sure i'll be a parent in the next couple of years i hope so um if i just make sure in my house all the food options are good for my kids, whole foods, all the good stuff you've described. Presumably then I can just unlock the cupboards and let them run free. I love talking to um, people <laughs> who might become parents We're about so what they think. Me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm like, wow, you just, I mean, yeah, good, good luck to you. Let's, can we have this conversation again in about yeah, yeah, six yeah. years? Can you tell so, me why I'm... So, what, no, what, what, well, you're yeah. not wrong. You're completely yeah. right. It will be impossible for you to limit the influx of ultra processed food into your house so clearly i've written the book on this i study this yeah. i would love to do that i want my kids to be normal being normal is really important as a kid and food isn't just stuff we put in to build our bodies food binds us to the people around us food is part of our community and our culture in the uk our food culture is ultra processed food and if you don't eat and drink ultra processed food you become a slightly odd person and so i still eat it when i go to friends houses because Otherwise, I look like some, you know, uh, snob, fanatical yeah. food snob. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, and it's the same with my kids. So, so uh, grandparents, friends, relatives, all bring it round. You don't control what they eat at school. Um, you know, my youngest one's a, a, a really nice nursery, but it's still ultra processed food from uh, from the minute she gets there to, to when she leaves. So um, very good luck to you. But this is why I argue, I, I nod to, if an individual wants to read my book, I think they will come away with technical knowledge that they will be able to use. And, and I wish them well with that. The big argument of the book is about this. This is about social justice. You know, it is, it is really appalling that even for people with, with a lot of means, real food is incredibly affordable and unavailable. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.